Our fast-paced lives are filled with distractions and divisions. But sometimes all it takes is an invitation to change someone's life. As a church, we believe that discipleship isn't confined by the walls of a building. True discipleship happens when we create the space to live our lives with others and grow together in Christ. Rather than build church buildings as a means of reaching and loving our world, we want to build tables. Together, we can build tables of love, compassion, and fellowship wherever we are. That sounds good. Thank you. We have the opportunity to see life transformation start right in our own homes, where our tables become bridges to transcend the boundaries that divide us, where hearts find comfort and the walls of isolation are broken, where burdens are shared and lasting memories are formed. Building Tables is more than just a sermon series. It's a call to live out our faith in practical ways and share the love of Christ with those around us. Because when we gather around the table, intentional relationships are formed, hearts are healed, and lives are changed for eternity. In the kingdom of God, we protest the building of barriers by building tables. I want to remind you what Jesus says the God of the table is like. Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners, verse 1, were all gathering around to hear him. This is Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost? Does he not go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is the God of the table. Verse 8, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the God of the table. Verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Some of us know what this feels like, which is about to be described in verse 17. When he came to his senses, you ever been there? I've had to come to my senses a couple times. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father. I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. The son said to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never ever disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the God of the table. I recently heard uh, a statement about this parable that really resonated with me. It said, in this parable, both sons leave the house. One in rebellion. One in resentment. And the father leaves the house to go after both. This is the God of the table. This is God. God is love. So if this is what God is like, and if this is what the God of the table is like, if this is what kind of love has been lavished on to us, the one who was lost, Why do I struggle so much to love the same way? I know this God. I've experienced this love. And yet I struggle deeply to love in the same way. Anybody else feel that? Why do we strug struggle so much to freely give others the same kind of love that has not just been extended or given to us, but that has been lavished upon us. Well, I don't wanna give us a cop out today, I do wanna make it real simple for us to understand. The reason we struggle, the reason I struggle to love in the same way that I have been loved is because it's hard. It's hard. We as a culture, we as individuals within a culture have been dehumanized in so many different ways. We have been formed, not in the language of love, but in the language of hate at times. And because we've been dehumanized and because we've been formed, we act a certain way. And so what we have to do is we have to confront this reality that even though the God of the table has invited me without reservation, without restriction, without any barriers, he has built a table for me and for you, I am not God. I'm trying to be more like God because I wanna be made in the image of Christ and I want to be a new creation, but culture and life and my own choices and sin, church, we do talk about sin, sin, being separated from God, making choices that separate us from the Lord, not because he doesn't love us anymore, but because he can't be in the presence of us. 
Sin keeps us from loving others the same way that we have been loved, right? We got any sinners in here? So it's hard. We've been challenged by scripture to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I don't know if I'm being real honest with myself if my neighbor wants to be loved like I love myself. You ever listen to how you talk to yourself? You ever think about the things that you say to yourself or the lies that you believe over and over and wonder, would my neighbor even want to be loved in that way? Not only are we hard on others, we're hard on ourselves. We live in a shame culture where we need to do this and we should do this and we have to do this versus living in a freedom culture where God's love for us so shines in our life that we get to choose how we act. We have agency to love neighbor as ourself. This is clear in scripture that this is our command. And yet we struggle so deeply to do it because knowing something and acting on something are two different things. I've read a lot of books about losing weight and not lost a pound. So wouldn't it be amazing We have a lot of lights in here. As a matter of fact, they're pretty blinding most of the time, especially if you're on stage. But wouldn't it be amazing if God, if God in his infinite mercy and love for us would just shine a spotlight on every person or every group that we or I were called to love? I'm in the grocery store, boom, spotlight. There it is. Okay, I know what to do. I'm just going to walk over and love them. Wouldn't that be amazing? Make life a lot easier. I'm not sure I would obey every time, but at least I would know. Just like in the parable of the Samaritan, we often ask like the young teacher did, which is, who's my neighbor? We know who our neighbor is. The question really is, is who's our Samaritan? Who's the one that I don't want to win? Who's the one that I was conditioned to hate? Who's the one that I was formed to hate? Who's the one that I have been given a pass to hate? Who's the other? Just like the woman in Luke 7. So we're called to love our neighbor as ourself. And I just think it would be amazing if God would shine a spotlight down and give us every answer we need. Well, he might not do that for us, but this is exactly what he did for Peter. We're gonna be in Acts 10. So in Acts 10, we've been in this passage before and there's a couple main characters. God shines a spotlight through a vision on exactly who Peter was called to love. Two characters in this story. One, Cornelius in Acts 10. He's a devout and God-fearing centurion who was also a Gentile. A Gentile would have been an outsider on the fringe of this faith community that had just been birthed. He was willing to be instructed and guiding. Another way to say this is Cornelius was coachable. Are you coachable? Are you coachable? Am I coachable? Cornelius was coachable. Peter is another character in this story. He was one of Jesus' disciples. We know Peter. We know all about Peter's falls. We know about Peter's um, being saved. We know about Peter's conversations with Jesus. We know that Peter was bold in his faith. Peter was an insider, a Jewish leader, a leader in the faith community, one who had witnessed all of Jesus' life. Both of these characters, both of these men had one thing in common, actually two things in common. They both received visions from the Lord. And catch this, and this is really important for today. This is really important for our lives. They both listened and obeyed. How many times have you heard what to do and not followed through? How many times have you said, Lord, give me exactly what I'm supposed to do, and he reveals to you what you're supposed to do, and yet we don't follow through, yet we don't obey? That's the difference between these two men and us at times. Peter, Cornelius, men of faith, listened to God and took action. This is so critical. 
Cornelius' specific vision was that he was approached by an angel of the Lord to send men to Joppa to bring back this Peter who he had never met. Peter's vision included a stern warning to not call anything impure that God has made clean. In Acts 10, we're going to pick up in verse 23 through 48. It says, the next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. I want to pause here. Peter is modeling exactly what it means to be a disciple. A lot of times we hear this word in faith communities, discipleship, disciple, disciple, disciple. What is a disciple? A disciple is one who hears and obeys. As a matter of fact, scripture would call that a disciple with wisdom. A wise man is one who listens and obeys. Peter is modeling exactly the right posture of a disciple. When he leaves without knowing where he's headed, he says, Lord, I don't know where you're leading me, but here I am. This is the posture of a disciple. Lord, I don't know where you're leading me, but here I am. This being a disciple is not for the faint of heart. I don't know where you're leading me, but here I am. Verse 24, the following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or even visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. I want you to catch what he's about to say here. May I ask why you sent for me? This is a big deal. Peter is a Jewish Christian in the house of a Gentile that is clearly against the law, but for God's command to do so. Peter has acted in faith, not acted with all of the details. He does not know exactly what's happening here. He just knows what he's experienced. And he said yes to the Lord. And in this moment, he asks a Gentile. He asks the other to clarify. Could you give me a little insight as to why I'm here? This is not the way I operate. I want to know the plan. And I want all the directions. And I want to know exactly what we're going to do when we get there and how long we have to be there. Peter has a different posture. He says, may I ask why you sent for me? So Cornelius answered in verse 30, three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly... A man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So I want you to notice something in this passage as this narrative by the author of um, Acts, Luke. Luke is the author of Acts. As this goes back and forth, you see that Peter talks and then Cornelius talks. And then it's back to Peter. Then it's back to Cornelius. Both men have visions. Both men are giving speeches or at least gaining awareness from each other about why they're in the room together. The author of this story is highlighting something that's very important. He's highlighting the dual nature of what's going on here. The listener is forced to ask this question. Is this story about the conversion of a Gentile or the conversion of an apostle, of a disciple? Is this the story of the conversion of an outsider or an insider? And we find out that it's a conversion story of both. Because both Cornelius and Peter need to be changed. 
for God's mission to go forward. I also want you to notice in this last passage how frequently the idea of houses and hospitality are mentioned in this story. This contact, this interaction between a Jew and a Gentile creates a real big problem. What's seemingly an ordinary question of who can eat at our table, who's welcome in our home is magnified in this story. This is a really beautiful scene. It's a beautiful scene where old divisions are being broken down. These men who were once at odds, Jew and Gentile, talk in a home that Peter was unable to enter prior to this without breaking the law. This is an incredibly warm scene that the author Luke is painting for us as he's showing us what is possible in the kingdom where God is leading both Cornelius and Peter. He's showing us what can be when we listen to the Father. Verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us. By us who ate and drank with him after he rose from dead. Peter's saying, I was there. I'm telling you, I'm a witness. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that Jesus is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Church, this is the gospel. There's not a better sermon than what Peter just preached. It's the good news that you have, if you're a believer, put your whole life around. This is gospel that Jesus came and he did exactly what the Father sent him to do. And it was completed on the cross so that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. I want you to say that word with me, everyone, everyone. Let's do it again, everyone. This sermon, or maybe this even speech by Peter, starts with something that's really, really incredible from a leader. Again, this was an insider. In his mind, he had nothing to gain from the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, there was a lot of confusion about why he was there. All he had done at this point, it's not a small thing, but what he had done at this point is received a vision and said yes to it and taken action. So he's in this place. And when he is asked to share what God has delivered to him, he does not do this from a posture of arrogance. This is a little nugget that I want us to take away from this because a lot of times we as Christians think we have to have all the right answers when what we're asking for is just tell us what God's been doing in your life. Don't tell me where I'm wrong. Don't tell me where you're right. Just share me, share with me the experience you've had with the Father. I guarantee you the experience we have had with the Father is a lot more impressive than the rules that we think we have to follow, especially to outsiders. And so Peter starts with what is an incredibly vulnerable posture from a leader who has been tasked with sharing what he has been tasked with. He starts with a confession. This is vulnerability. It's weakness to the world, and it's power in the kingdom of God. He confesses 
I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Wow. I recently saw a um, post on Instagram where Carrie Newhoff, a Christian author and writer, asked this. Pastors, when was the last time you admitted to your congregation that you struggle with doubt, argue with your spouse, or worry about money? Transparency is not a weakness. We see this in Peter. His transparency that his posture is shifting is not a weakness. As a matter of fact, it's a testimony to what the Lord is doing in his life. And it softens the room. It gives the people in the room ears to hear because they know he's not hostile. He's not coming at them. He is learning in process. He is growing in process. This is what a disciple does. A disciple hears and obeys and changes his mind when God leads him to a place or her to a place that they're supposed to go. Peter and his vision that he has reminds us that left to our own devices, we're unable to know what is clean or unclean. As a matter of fact, because of his transparency and his humility, Peter has the ear of the room now. And we know because of what he says that the purpose of God's vision to him that is being revealed to him is now clear. It was a vision about food, or at least Peter thought it was a vision about food. Now he realizes that it was about people. Peter goes on to make a bold claim in this passage that we just read that Christ's lordship is not something to be proved merely from the Torah or the prophets but from the experience of the faith of the apostles. A commentator that I was reading summed it up this way, and it's such a great challenge to us as a church that I wanted us to see this quote and just sit in it for a second. It's gonna be on the screen. This is the way it is sometimes in the church. If Jesus Christ is Lord, then the church has the adventurous task of penetrating new areas of his lordship expecting surprises and new implications of the gospel, which cannot be explained on any other basis than the fact that our Lord has shown us something we could not have seen on our own, even if we were looking only at scripture. Now this does not mean it's an undisciplined flight of fancy into our own bold new ideas or the pitiful effort to catch the wind of the latest trend in the culture under the guise of seeking new revelation. Rather, it means that we are continuing to penetrate the significance of the scriptural witness that Jesus Christ is Lord and to be faithful to divine prodding. Faith, when it comes down to it, is often, it's our often breathless attempt to keep up, to keep up with the redemptive activity of God, to keep asking ourselves, what is God doing? Where on earth is God going now? It's an adventurous task, church. In verse 44, it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard him, them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them a few days. Peter's new awareness that the Gentiles were welcome is confirmed by the spirit descending on Cornelius and his family. This creates a reality that the author of this new plot twist is God. There's no confusion now about the Gentiles being welcome in to the fellowship of believers. Peter makes this point in verse 47 that no one can forbid baptism. No one can build a wall. No one can build a barrier to the Gentiles after the Holy Spirit has already landed on them. In the kingdom of God, church, we protest the building of barriers by building tables. So what can we learn from this passage? One, Christians, believers in Jesus, posture themselves to listen 
And when they hear from the Lord, they obey. This is what both Peter and Cornelius did. Don't miss this part of the story. They both listened, they both obeyed. Andy Stanley once said, you have no idea what hangs in the balance of your obedience. Can you imagine if one of these men had not chosen to obey? I think God would have done what God's gonna do because I think he chases after us like we see in Luke 15. But just for a moment, can you imagine the reality of one of these men, Peter or Cornelius, hearing from the Lord and not obeying? We would not be sitting in this room. We would not be welcome at the table. Never, never underestimate what hangs in the balance of your obedience. When God says to build a table, build the table. Christians, always go first. In the kingdom of God, we protest the building of barriers by building tables. Number two, Christians build tables with the expectation that they are going to be expanded. I want you to think about this scene. I want you to think about Thanksgiving Day. You're um, in a dining room that's a little bit too small for all the people in it. You might have an older table there that is a little bit tight, a little egg salad, a little jello pudding, shoulders tight, arms in, because everyone's around the table. You know this scene, right? Some of you don't know this scene because you've been at the kid table. So what's happening at this table is Thanksgiving meal and the adults are getting to eat. And then you get a knock on the door and all of a sudden um, your uncle or your cousin or someone who's always invited shows up but you weren't expecting them. And they brought their friends. So what happens? You don't send them to the kid's table, that'd be weird. You don't just send them in an unhospitable way to the living room, no. Somebody stands up and they go to the hall closet. And what's in that hall closet? Yeah, this block of wood that sits there 99% of the year. It's called a leaf. You get it out of the closet. It's awkward. Everybody pushes their chairs back from the table. One person who's strong gets on this side. One person who's strong gets on this side. Somebody goes to the garage to get the WD-40, right? And you say, all right, pull. You open the table. This was a table that was designed to be expanded. You open the table for the other, for the guest that you didn't know was going to be there. And someone slides the, ta- the little leaf in without you know, slamming your fingers in it. You say, watch out, you push it back together and you sit down and you share a meal. Some of us have been the ones at the table who have been part of expanding it. And some of us, myself included, have been the ones that others have expanded their table for. This is what it looks like We as Christians design tables that are meant to be expanded because we know the Lord is always at work. We live in eager expectation that God is always up to something new. And that something is usually a person. It's a who. And they are welcome at the table. In the kingdom of God, we protest the building of barriers by building tables. Third, Christians confront their bias and prejudice. Before you tune me out, just hear me. It's not enough just to love our neighbor. We have to ask who our Samaritan is. Again, we have to ask Who is it that I have been conditioned to, at the very least, just not want welcome at the table? Peter receives a new vision 
of who is welcome in the kingdom of God. And he shifts his posture. This same Peter who had kept all the rules up to this point receives a new reality from the Lord. And he doesn't necessarily argue with the Lord. He asks some clarifying questions, which is more than okay. And the Lord gives him a vision of what he's to do next and reminds him, do not call anything impure that I have called clean. And Peter acts. Not only does he act, but in humility, he admits to the people he was sent to that he has received a revelation from the Lord. And because of this, the table is wide open. It's amazing. In the kingdom of God, we protest the building of barriers by building tables. So, we've been in this series all summer long. And I want to leave you with two things that you can do that are really, really practical. And I want to give you some marching orders here. And then, just so you get ready a little bit, we're going to practice in real time. All right? This is what a good coach does, is they make you do a little practice. There's two things that I want to encourage you to do as we think about building tables. One, and I'm going to make no um, bones about this, but I want to give you a why here. We want you to be in community of some kind. One of the ways to do that is to be in a life group here at Fellowship. Now, before you tune me out on this, give me a second, please. You may have been in a life group before and it didn't go well. You may have been in a life group in another church and it's too stringent. You may not have time. I get it. I totally get it. We believe that being in community with learning and, and challenging ourselves to grow in our knowledge of Jesus in community and then practicing what we're learning and the Holy Spirit doing what the Holy Spirit does, working together in all of that gives us the opportunity to be spiritually transformed. Without community, it is incredibly difficult for us to experience transformation. When we're in community, we are pressed and we are prodded and we are challenged and we're invited and we're encouraged. And so I'm asking you this fall, as everything's ramping up in your life, to not miss on getting margin in your life to be in community. And one way to do that is to be in a life group. So if you're a current member of a group, that's incredible. I want you to ask yourself what kind of table your group has been building. Has your group been building a table that is anticipating an expansion? Or is it a table that's pretty closed? I'm asking you to potentially open that table up and invite someone and make them welcome, just like you've been. Maybe you are part of a table, you're part of a community life group, and you have been thinking about leading for a long time. I wanna remind you, don't ever underestimate what your obedience could do for someone else. Take that prompt from the Lord. Step into leadership. We'll walk with you. We'll prepare you. We'll train you. We'll encourage you along the way. You'll get a coach to help you walk into this. We will not leave you alone. Mitzi and her team do an incredible job of walking with leaders, setting them up for success. Build that table where the kingdom of God can break out. Or if you're not in a group, I would love for you to ask the Lord if stepping into a community of people that are trying to experience transformation is for you. Would you consider that? Second thing, this is probably the easiest one. Would you come back next week? We're kicking off a new series. Dr. Tim Robinson's gonna be preaching next week in the book of Acts about the church that changed the world. We wanna be a church that changes the world. And after service, we're gonna have another picnic together. We're gonna to build tables for all of us to be together. And I'm just asking you to join us for a meal. Would you do that, please? Now we're gonna practice. A lot of times at the beginning of service, what's something that we do almost every week? We stand and we greet each other, right? This is not a practice for us just so that we can see if infectious disease is still roaming throughout the world. 
No, as a matter of fact, this is a theological practice for us. When we ask you to stand or when Noah and the team ask you to stand and to greet someone next to you, this is a declaration to the world. It's a reminder. It's a practice for eternity that we are not alone, that we are interdependent on each other and that we need each other and that the kingdom of God that's breaking out here amongst his people has a lot of different skin colors has a lot of different people in different socioeconomics. It's multi-diverse, it's multi-ethnic. And it is God's picture of eternity. So stand with me, church. I'm not gonna make you practice long and I have some more things to say in just a minute, but for one minute, greet somebody and be reminded that you're not alone. Go. Twenty seconds, twenty seconds. Ten seconds. All right, stay standing for me. Stay standing for me. Church, you are not alone. You are called to be with each other. You are part of God's community and the community of God and the kingdom of God. We protest the building of barriers by building tables. All right, if you can hear me, hold up one finger. Like elementary PE. Okay, how many of you know Paul Harvey? The, the guy on the radio, right? What did he always say? Now you know the rest of the story. Can I give you the rest of the story? Acts 11. I'm not going to keep you here long. In chapter 11 of Acts, the word, the rumor mill has started. There's a new group that's invited to be part of the kingdom of God. While this may be good news to some, this is very confusing to others. And so the Christians who knew Peter, the, the Jewish Christians start to criticize Peter. The word gets out that the Gentiles are welcome. Peter's criticized. So he tells them the story of what God is up to and what God has been doing and what he experienced. And I love this. They believed him. Sometimes we're so skeptical that we don't believe but they believe him. They got the real story from his mouth. And scripture tells us that they had no further objections and they praised God saying, so then even to Gentiles, even to the other, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Church, this is our posture. In the kingdom of God, we subversively, with a loud voice, protest the building of barriers that the world would call us to, and we build tables where we eat together and we look at each other and we share stories and we celebrate what God is doing, how he came after us when we were the one and he tracked us down with his love. This is our story. We also celebrate and we praise the Lord when someone, even the other, receives salvation that leads to life. This is our posture. In the kingdom of God, we protest the building of barriers by building tables. 
And as we prepare ourselves for communion this morning, I wanna leave you with this powerful, dynamic, adventurous, scary verse. Galatians 3, 26 through 29 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized, who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all, say it with me, all, all, one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. As we worship, may we celebrate what God is up to. May we celebrate who God is up to. And may we give him all the praise. Let's worship together. Sing this out, praise. Say praise.
have a seat. I want to invite you and welcome you to the table of the Lord. The table of the Lord is a place where there is an overflow of abundance of grace and forgiveness. The table of the Lord is a table that is open to everyone. The table of the Lord is a place where everyone is equal. The thing we have in common is a need to be forgiven and to be reminded that we need to be forgiven. And the table of the Lord was designed to be expanded. And you'd be surprised how many new leaves are in the table of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, it says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ. that little piece of cracker sticks in your teeth. Be reminded about the God who chases after the one that you just can't get away from. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, the blood of Christ. Father, thank you for making the place at the table for us. Thank you for being a designer who built a table that was meant for expansion. How we love you. We need you. Father, thank you for chasing after us. Thank you for running toward us. Thank you for giving us a brand new robe and a ring and an incredible feast. Thank you for leaving the banquet to chase after us when we are full of resentment. When we're full of rebellion, Father, thanks for sitting on that porch, longing for our return. Thank you for seeing us with compassion and running toward us. It's amazing. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So church, this week, would you protest the building of barriers by building tables? Go in peace. Have a great week.